Today, I'm joined by Estée Lalonde, the self-care guru, beauty YouTuber, and founder of the lifestyle brand, Mirror Water. With our mutual love for rituals and mindfulness in business and innovation, this is one conversation you cannot miss. Hi everyone, and welcome to Family Beauty, a podcast dedicated to beauty entrepreneurs who built some of the biggest brands today, and where we learn exactly how they did it. We'll cover some of the most intimate stories, their path to success, and how they overcame the obstacles along the way. I'm Akash Mehta, CEO and co-founder of Fable & Main, a modern hair wellness brand inspired by ancient Indian beauty secrets. Building Fable & Main has been an incredible journey so far, and I decided to launch this podcast as a founder keen to learn and connect with fellow beauty brand founders around the world. I believe in collaboration over competition, so I'm using this platform as a way to hopefully help and inspire each other in what can be quite a tough and lonely journey. So if you are an entrepreneur or simply just curious how to build a brand, this podcast is perfect for you. So without further ado, it's a delight to welcome our guest for today, Estée Lalonde. She is a London-based influencer known for her beautiful content creation, her love of all things beauty, and her open conversations around mental health with her online community. She's also the founder of Mirror Water, a body care and lifestyle brand rooted in principles of daily ritual and self-reflection. This really speaks to me as a founder of an Ayurvedic inspired beauty brand, because for me, rituals and beauty go hand in hand. And it's a way to pause and reconnect with not only your skin and bodies, but our minds too. And I love that Este has focused especially on the therapeutic ritual of bathing. And it truly brings together everything that she's been advocating and becoming renowned for in her community of over 1 million YouTube followers over the last 10 years. So it's my absolute pleasure and honor to sit down with Este. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm all nervous now. <laughs> I wasn't before, but I am now. You know what? <laughs> it's always the case, right? Because I, I'm sometimes when you're on the other side of the lens, it's always a bit like uh, when you're being interviewed. It sometimes we we I I wonder like now I'm so used to being an uh, interviewer that sometimes when I get asked to do a podcast, I'm like, ooh, I don't know what I would say. I overthink <laughs> it now. But it's always uh, we're gonna make this oh, no. a fun conversation. You got this. Yes. You, you, you're, you're and I'm so excited to speak yeah. to you. And I love what you said about. Um, uh, collaboration versus competition because I feel exactly the same way. So excited to chat to you today. Yeah. Oh, me too. So first things first, I ask all my guests the same question. I'm going to ask you, who in a nutshell is Este? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, I think, honestly, I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, my brand, first of all, is all about self-reflection and self-love. And I think I'm always trying to reflect on what makes me feel good, what makes me feel bad, what feels comfortable to me. And I think we're always learning about who we are. Um, I think as I get older, I'm learning just to do the things that make me happy and not put myself in situations that feel stressful. And um, sometimes it's hard to say no, and sometimes it's hard to stand your ground. But I think, yeah, as I'm getting older, I'm learning more, you know, about who I am. I think um, to give a brief overview of who I am. I'm 33. Well, going to be 33 in August. And I'm originally yeah. from Canada. I, um, I was born and raised there. And I moved to the UK when I was 19. And a lot of people say, Oh, you're so brave to do that. And I'm like, actually, it was just very naive and stupid. <laughs> I didn't know what um, was, you know, in my future path. So I wasn't that brave. I was just a little bit naive. So thankfully, that uh, worked out in my favor. Because after I moved to England, I started a blog, then I started a YouTube channel. And then over the past sort of 1415 years, I've built my online community um, on YouTube and um, you know, social media, Instagram. And most recently, a year and a half ago, I launched my own brand, which is all about, as you said, self care rituals, bathing. Um, and I think my close friends would probably say, surprisingly, I'm quite introverted, even though I make YouTube videos and have shared my life for so long. I'm actually very into quiet time. I like reading. I'm actually not very social and I have a dog and that's pretty much all you need to know about me. <laughs> I love that. And I totally get your last point. I mean, like often I tell people I'm like this introvert, quiet person. I, 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 and then they're like, 
but I see you on social. You're the absolute opposite. You're everywhere. You're so out there. And I'm like, yeah, that's like a slither. Like you'll find me most evenings doing my Lego at home on my own, just phone away, <laughs> just in my little bubble. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I am. So yeah. I completely understand. I completely get it. Uh, but you get the best yeah. of both. I think going on social media brings that side of us, right? Which is so nice to explore. Definitely. And I think what a lot of people forget is that when we all started making YouTube videos, we did it because we were in the comfort of our own bedrooms and our own homes. And we were just speaking to one camera. So it really, it was daunting, but not as daunting as maybe it is now. Um, because there were no people. It was just, you know, it was my mom watching my YouTube videos for the longest time. And now there's a lot more people that have watched and have joined me on my journey, but it didn't start out that way. And it just slowly built up. And yeah, yeah I just sometimes want to go live on a deserted island and bury my head in the sand. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. I mean, one thing I want to ask is, I mean, uh, when you talk about like, you know, building a social media audience, and obviously in the lockdown, you know, there's a lot of people that have known you, but it's all been virtually for a lot of the time. And then when you create a brand, we know this, that we have to go out there. We have to advocate. We've got to do, you know, uh, desk sides and store visits, et cetera. How has that been like to kind of um, be out there more physically, but like since lockdown, but like as an advocate for your brand, as opposed to Estée Lalonde, you know? Yeah, it's very different and it's actually quite complicated because I'm there as the brand founder, but I think I'm also still there as yeah. Estée Lalonde, the personality or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, when yeah. retailers, for instance, buy into the brand, they're also buying into me. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of like a cherry on top. I'm a brand founder, but I also have this amazing community. Um, so it's hard to kind of play both roles. And it's almost double the work in a way because I have to, you know, promote it from the brand side, but then I also have to promote it from my personal channel side. So I feel a little... Um, thinly stretched right now and it's definitely been a steep learning curve since starting my brand um it's yeah. it's a lot which we can get into and i think everyone yeah. always said to well, me yeah. you don't understand it till you do it yourself but honestly it is so much work but you love it of course but it's I it's agree. like a, a level yeah. of work i've never experienced before yeah, no, we'll, we'll we'll get into it because trust me, and you know I know because when we when we have our own beauty brands, it, it, the grind never stops, and there's never a, a day where you could do more or less. It's just there's always um, work, but there's so much passion that makes it not feel like work. So I, I feel you. Um, but uh, before we get into the brand and how it started, I want to talk a little bit about that journey in building your community because it's so important and a big integral part of where you are today. Um, so just what are some of those kind of experiences that you think are interesting to share with the audience listening that, um, how you landed, you know, this incredible, um, kind of audience that have been loyal to you from YouTube? Well, I have to say a lot of people that still watch my videos are the people that started watching my videos 14, 15 years ago. So they've really stayed with me. And if I think back to those early days, it was like the wild, wild west. No one had done this before. No one understood the consequences that sharing your life might have on you mentally. Um, and no one really understood where it was going. We were all just doing it for fun. And I think in the beginning, I really overshared. Looking back on it now, I shared every single detail about my life, every emotion, every facet of my relationship. Um, I was literally filming while I ate dinner, you know, with my then boyfriend, you know, and looking back on it, did I really need to share that? Did I really need to, you know, not take that personal time? So I think after that sort of happened and lots of years went by, I realized, you know, maybe I am sharing too much. Maybe I'm getting burnt out. But that being said, that authenticity was what sort of hooked people in and what made people feel like they really knew me. So I wouldn't do it differently, but I think um, as I got older, I sort of realized I need to have those boundaries. Um, and that being said, I think now I've gone maybe too far the other way. I'm not sharing enough because I'm a little bit, um, I think I have, I'm a little, have a little bit of PTSD from it, honestly. But I've been thinking recently, you know, I need to share some stuff and people want to know and it is my job. So 
it's always that fine line between what to share. And I think I'm going through a bit of a personal change where I'm going to start sharing a, a few, a few more things about my life. Um, so stay tuned for that. But I think just the way that I built the community uh, was just through being myself and sharing not necessarily the most exciting things. People liked watching me clean my apartment. They liked seeing my dog and they still like those same things today. So a lot of people always say, oh, I want to vlog, but my life isn't interesting. It's like, you don't need to be interesting. You're more interesting than you think. Um, and it was just slowly, slowly, slowly yeah. over time. It was not an overnight sort of boom. Now I have this YouTube community and Instagram community. It really did take a lot of time. I love. I mean, one thing I want to ask, and this is more like uh, me personally. I, I have a li I have a little bit of a social media audience, but it came from my old days when I was doing travel and being with Dior. You get exposed to a lot of interesting people, and then now I sort of have my own brand. I find it quite hard because there is part of my brain that's like social media is about less curation. Just feel what you want to do. You know, if you have a week where you don't want to post, don't post. If you want a week where you want to post everything, go for it, right? But ultimately, the only constant that I end up doing is feeling like I want to post about my brand. And eventually, I just post my whole feed is like Fable and Main updates, right? And people love that. But I get a lot of people being like, hey, I, will, I can follow Fable and Main for that. Show more about you. And I'm like, I don't want to. I just want to post about my brand. How do you balance now as a founder, which is another part of you, right? Your existence. How do you find that balance? Because it's hard. I don't know how you're doing it. That's that's a great question, and I don't have an answer for you, unfortunately, because as we said okay, earlier, when so. you're a brand founder, <laughs> yeah, you're, you eat, breathe, sleep your brand. So naturally, that's what I want to share. I want to share, oh, we have this event coming up, or oh, we just did this, or oh, we just interviewed that person. But actually, that's probably slightly boring for the people who are following you for your personal journey. But when you're a brand founder, you have no social life anymore. You have no life. So there's not much to share. But I think you're right. I You have to have that balance between sharing it. And of course, it's in my best interest to share it. I want my community to see what I'm doing with my brand. But also, you don't want to annoy people and then they unfollow you anyway. So yeah. I think I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, but like you said, for the most part, people are excited for you to hear about your brand. But you're, yeah, I, I also I, I needed to hear this today because I need to maybe share a bit less. Yeah, <laughs> the, 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 there's no balance. I think that's the answer. But I think I think it's just uh, awareness of like, um, I think definitely people do want to connect more. That's why founder led brands are really uh, powerful. It's because people knew the founder for a long time beforehand. So I think it's our duty as a founder led brand to, to keep on. Um, I guess like either drip feeding or pulsing the the personality of us beyond the brand because it's another way to connect and ultimately it does make them like the brand even more, right? So it's a kind of a business decision too of um, it's why they joined the journey in the first place is when you showed your life, right? Um, a bit yeah, more. it's true. But I, I've always yeah. said, for instance, I will never share my relationships again because I had a very public breakup yeah. and it was horrible to go through mm. an experience. But, you know, that was like, I don't know, six years ago. And I've never shared a relationship that I've had since because I'm so stressed about just, I don't know, that was just such a, to yeah. a toxic time in my life. But at the same time, I want to share yeah. those moments. So that's why I'm not sure. It's yeah. like, I want to share, but I don't want to share. So it's tricky. Honestly, like I, I, I think it's good to always have those protective mindset mechanisms that just remind us to like, hey, you remember this? Or remember what could be? Just like think about it. But ultimately, we and you and I both know we've got to go with our heart and gut. And if we want to yeah. do something, life's too short. Just do it. You know, <sighs> that's it. Uh, but do it. Do, do, do it in the right cadence, in the right way, step by step. No need to rush into yeah. it. Yeah, because I'll just show sure, his hands like still. holding something. Yeah, exactly. And... <laughs> you, you know, you, you you never, you know, it's so funny. Talk about hands, this is a really random anecdote, but I think this is one of the coolest stories. Um, In Saudi, because we, we have our brand in Saudi Arabia and, and Dubai, Middle East, and there's um an influencer in Saudi that's got million plus followers and all she shows is her hand. Doesn't so no one knows her face, but she's built a million followers with her hand and her 
lifestyle. Whoa. Right? And people in the stores, when they see her hat, and they're like, oh my God, it's not you. Because they recognize all the elements of like the beauty spot and this. And I find that oh. so interesting. So don't underestimate the power of a hand as well. And I'm just, it's a, kid, it's a joke. But that still, is so it does, funny. It's funny. Uh, and yeah. actually, so, I have a story yeah, to go is, on uh, from that. I did actually show yeah. his arm once and somebody responded weeks later because I showed his arm again and they said, is that the same elbow that we saw in Italy? I thought, how <laughs> do you know his elbow? But anyway, I think the cat's out of bed. <laughs> people, you could, yeah, people uh, never cease to su uh, surprise me, but uh, let's leave it like that. But um, well, what's, um, what I really want to go into though is the, um, the brand story now, because we've been alluding to it a bit, but I think it's important to, to start at the beginning. So First off, the name and the, you know, the inspiration behind it. How did it come around? Well, like so many of us, um, I, I sort of, I've always wanted to have a brand. Maybe not everyone wants a brand, but I feel like I've, I've always wanted to have a brand. I've never really figured out what it was. Um, and I had many opportunities throughout the course of my career to kind of put my name on a package and sell it and, you know, call it a day. But that never felt quite right to me. Um, I knew that if I created a brand, I wanted to own the brand. I wanted to develop the brand from the ground up and I wanted to formulate my own products, et cetera. But again, I, I didn't have that sort of magic dust and think, ooh, that's the idea until the pandemic. I, um, like so many people, my life completely changed and I was in a a personally quite a difficult emotional time. Um, I had just gone through another breakup and um, I had also just adopted my dog who is from Greece and she is so nervous and so scared. So I was living by myself with this little puppy from Greece who wouldn't even look at me in the eye and, you know, single. My family was across the world in Canada and I thought, what am I doing with my life? Um, you know, I was exhausted. I was burnt out from creating content over the years and I just, for the first time ever, stopped. I wasn't posting content. Mm -hmm. I was basically just depressed and having a bath every day if I could muster the strength for that. And I thought, God, I love having baths. Mm -hmm. If I didn't have baths and hot showers, I don't think I could make it through life because it is really the that one thing for me that makes me feel better. And my mom always says, mm -hmm. you always feel better after a hot shower and it's true it you really really do for some reason i don't know if it's the water on your head or you know when you're having a bath just submerging yourself in this warm water it's so comforting and for some reason things just feel a little bit different afterwards and i thought that is the one constant in my life that i've loved as far as a beauty um ritual is bathing and i felt like there weren't really that many brands talking about body care um and this is also three years ago when I started really sort of formulating the concept of the, of the brand. Um, there weren't that many brands speaking to me, especially on a social media level, like a lot of the maybe heritage bath and body care brands, they have great products, but they didn't have that community around them. And that was sort of the light bulb moment for me. I thought, what if I do a bath and body care brand that also leverages the community that I've already built and I can create a space that's all about, you know, wellness, but in a realistic way, not a way that's going to make you feel even more guilty for not doing enough. Um, and that's sort of when the idea happened. And I've heard a lot of founders say, you know, you know, you need to do it because that idea is just not going away. And it just was not going away. I was making Pinterest boards. I was brainstorming on actual sheets of paper. I was calling my friends, asking them what their favorite bath products were. I was just like, go, go, go. And it really helped me, first of all, get through the pandemic because I had a focal point of things that I, you know, was learning about. And I also started getting interested in how do you actually set up a brand and a company? Because I'd never done that before. I'd never opened an Excel spreadsheet. I had never set up a company. I'd never done the, you know, legal due diligence how do you actually do it? And I started watching lots of webinars and I subscribed to the Y Combinator YouTube channel. And I started learning about the process of setting up an actual beauty company. And honestly, there was a little part of me that thought, 
can I do this? Like there was that little thing in me that was like, do you think I can actually do this? And once I thought, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to try it. Then there was just no stopping me. And um, it took a little while to obviously formulate the products. And um, a year and a half ago, we launched the brand. It's called Mirror Water. We are designed for your downtime. We are hoping to inspire more self-care rituals more often, uh, whether that's walking, whether that's stretching, you know, whether that's fitness, whether that's having a bath or having a hot shower, whatever it is, it's going to make you feel better. But obviously my passion is bathing and we've got four products, bath salts, body scrub, body oil, and a balm. They're all made in the UK. Um, of course, I'm a product girly, so I, I needed to formulate the products well. They're, they're gorgeous products inspired by nature. And it's been a whirlwind ever since. It's, uh, I mean, I can tell you like, and also proof of the pudding that these things do work, even though I spent money on them, I don't know if they do. But I first saw your brand on, well, I think I've seen it in like articles and stuff, but I first really like noticed and saw it on a, out of home, like those posters, uh, right? Yes. I think it was like near Great Portland Street. Um, and I yes. was like, this is beautiful. The branding, the, the, the everything. And I was like, I have to learn more. And then I went on, found everything about it. And I was obsessed. And I love that you had this slogan, responsible, not sustainable, meaning like, you know, we're not, not, not another sustainable brand. It's really about this transparency of responsibility. Can you talk us a little bit about also that side of the business? I think it's really important. Definitely. I think, of course, any brand that launches now has sustainability at the forefront, but it's so hard to know what sustainable even means anymore. I mean, ultimately, let's be real, launching a range of products isn't sustainable. We, we obviously are creating exactly. more waste and, and more packaging. So for me, it just didn't feel authentic to say we're so super sustainable. Um, so like you said, we say we're responsible, not sustainable. We try to have the most eco-friendly packaging that we feel for our brand um, is glass packaging. And we're actually in the midst of switching all of our lids to aluminum lids right now. They're plastic. So, you know, as a small brand, it's hard. You can't just come out of the gate with the most eco-friendly packaging, those minimum order quantities. And we're always trying to learn and do better. Um, but it's hard as a small brand. So we try to formulate our products as naturally as possible. All of our products are over 99% naturally derived, which is great. Um, and we don't use lots of those nasty ingredients um, that, you know, you might see in other, other products. And um, we're just trying our best to be as sustainable as possible. Our um, gift sets that we have are in mushroom packaging. So you might have seen them, but it's called mycelium. And it's a uh, material made out of mushrooms and it's hundred percent biodegradable, which is, you know, a little bit unique to see in like Liberty and Space NK. They've never really launched anything like that before, but um, we're trying our best to minimize the amount of waste, of course. I love that. So you talked about so what is the retail landscape for Mirror Water right now and for people to discover the brand? Yes. So when we launched the brand, we had lots of interest from retailers, which was so exciting. And um, we decided to launch exclusively with Space NK, which was amazing. I mean, I can't lie. It was a super exciting moment for me. It's hard to get in there. And I think as we've kind of gone on, I'm realizing how hard it actually is um, for just to be noticed um, within a retailer like Space NK. So really excited. And then once that exclusivity was over, we launched into Liberty, which was so exciting. And the buzz around launching in Liberty was huge. People love Liberty. I love Liberty. So to be you know, in those two stores was super exciting for us. Um, we're also in a couple other smaller retailers in East London, um, like Goodhood and Big and Hackney. And we're excited to hopefully expand our retail partners. Um, but you know what it's like. It's tough to get time with these retailers and get in the door because there's so oh, much yeah. competition. Any advice? Honestly, that's a great question. I, ha I have a few advice, I will. Um, generally speaking, I feel like the, the first is, and especially for, I mean, let's, I'll, I'll give advice for starting founders and then a bit later is, the exclusivity part is very important, right? That's your first gateway and making sure you choose the right partner for exclusivity. We've had some good exclusives in some market and some not so good ones that kind of shot us in the foot. So uh, 
I would definitely say when you give exclusivity, like if it's like, oh yeah, year is fine. Like consider maybe even six months, like, you know, every month does make a potential difference. <laughs> so just as an FYI, but generally speaking for, for retail, I would say the biggest thing to, to, to balance is when you go into a, a market, do you consider one major player and focusing all your budget and energy on that to, to, to be heard, to be seen and to win? Because as you know, it's not about getting the retail always. It's about staying in the retail and being seen by the retail. Because ultimately, in some retailers where we're really not that big for them, we email them like every week and we get like no reply. And then we're just probably yeah. because they have 100 brands and we're their least priority. And for the retailers that like we're really doing well in, we email them every day and they reply within 10 minutes. We have WhatsApp with them, right? Like a Sephora in the US. So I think it's about there we chose after three years in Sephora US and Canada to stay exclusive and we extended our exclusivity another year and a half just because we, we, we're, we're committed. And it was important for me to, to value that partnership. So yeah, long-winded answer is... First, decide if you want a one-off long-term bigger partner, and that has to be a big retail. I'm talking, you know, a lot more doors than just one, uh, like, a, like a Selfridges, Harrods in London wouldn't be the biggest player to work with because they only have X stores, right? You're not going to get a lot of revenue, even if you're winning in them because they're only X amount of opportunity. Um, a Space in K is a better exclusive partner because you have multiple stores, which means potentially a lot more revenue every time. Um, UK is really tough. I'll be honest, yeah. there isn't really a beauty retailer unless you're in the mastige of a boots or a super drug that you can have a lot of revenue. So you have to sort of play the game of a lot of retailers and then collectively make revenue. Um, do you find the same? I don't know, in the UK. Yes. It's a tough one. Right? I find exactly the same. And um, I'm actually friends with a founder who's based in the US and she's trying to make the UK happen. And she's like, it is so much harder here in the UK than it is in the US. Um, just in terms of volume. And you're right, there's not that store necessarily that there is in um, North America. So it's actually reassuring for me to hear that. But um, we have a lot of customers based in the U.S. that are shipping their orders over from the U.K. So we're really keen to kind of explore the U.S. But I think what a lot of people mm. don't understand is, yes, you can get that Sephora um, partnership, which amazing. But you can't just launch in Sephora and then let it do the work for you. You have nope. to constantly and consistently hustle to get those sales in yeah. Sephora. And that takes Spend budget. Money. That takes time. Yeah, and it's it's really tough in these mm -hmm. early stages. So I'm I'm in the middle of it. <laughs> oh my god! Well, offline, you call me, and I'll give you all my tips and tricks because um, I will be. It's uh, the landscapes has sh shifted a bit. I will tell you in the US, where the the the, the Sephora's and Ultras don't have the the. I wouldn't say the patience, probably a harsh word, but like the time and the ability to nurture upcoming brands as much as they did before, because now they're a little bit more thinking about uh, productivity, efficiency, and you have new brands that are entering their space and then doing crazy volume. I'm talking like millions, like 20, 30 million plus revenue in the first six months year, in, in a year. So, uh, you know, the new brands are now no longer their attention. They're looking at that. Sephora ultimately, well, most big retailers like Ulta Sephora ultimately care about two things. If a brand is gonna bring them good revenue or good customer acquisition, if you can showcase those two things, Product differentiation, yes, but ultimately the first two. Um, so, you know, either you're saying, hey, I'm a celebrity brand, I'm going to bring you a lot more customers, or hey, I'm a Indian Ayurvedic brand, I'm going to bring you a lot of South Asian consumers, right? That's interesting to them. They're like, you know what? We need a new diversity of customers with this. But ultimately, revenue speaks the loudest. And to get the revenue, as you've rightly said, it's, it's really about spending and, and, and playing the game with them. So, you know, not launching and then figuring it out. It's having the strong P&L to to match all the opportunities you can do, like sampling. And when you go to the US, everything's on steroids. Like a sampling opportunity for an email would be 70,000 sachets, not choose what you want, you know? So um, you have to have the budget for that and, and gratis it. So yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Um, but in the UK, I'm an open book. I always share everything. I feel like um, a lot of brands from the on the West thinking about coming to the East, um, if you're still not sure about which retailer to choose, um, starting with a pure player like Cult Beauty, even though there are some issues here and there, generally it's still our largest revenue in the UK from a retail perspective. 
versus our Selfridges and our Sephora UK and all this stuff. So, yeah. you know, it's a good stepping stone. It's not necessarily giving up your brick and mortar exclusivity until you know your market and then figure out what's the best partner here on the ground. Um, it's enough. Well, it's I want to be on Cult Beauty, so fingers crossed that they take us. I don't know why they haven't. Well, let me know. Yeah, <laughs> anything beauty, I can do cult. to help. But we'll, we'll, again, we'll talk, we'll, we'll we'll talk, talk offline. offline. Uh, I, I got you. Um, uh, <laughs> but um, it is just yeah, so it's important, I think, that we're, we're open. Yeah. 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 And and I think if I could yeah. have heard these types of conversations earlier on, I, I would have maybe understood that it's not as easy as calling cult beauty and getting them to, to stalk you. And then that's that. Uh, I don't think I was really aware of yeah. that. Yeah, but but in a way, it's good to sometimes at the beginning go in, um, sem- not not always blindly, but a little bit because you don't always know till you know. If that makes sense. Every brand is a little bit different. Every story and every time that you launch is different. Like when I launched in Sephora, how we got into Sephora was a LinkedIn message, um, uh, messaging a junior hair merchant. We launched. We were in the kitchen with them for a year, developing it. And then we launched day one in store and online. It was like a very different wow. time. Today, I wouldn't be advising that book to really anyone <laughs> to launch in store wow. day one of the beginning of your brand because it's 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 hard, right? Like to to man six hundred stores and do it that like. But <laughs> I figured it out. I quickly saved myself. But bearing in mind it was lockdown, I was in London and I couldn't visit US for two years. So you know there were wow. things that. It worked because of because of lockdown. Lockdown gave me that that moment to say stores are closed. Okay, we're easing you into Sephora. You can only really focus online. And then we get back into the store. So I was saved a bit, if that makes sense. But I was mm-hmm. I didn't know. Oh wait, I have to be how productive in store to be staying in store. Otherwise, I'm kicked out. You know all that stuff. I didn't know till I tried it or did it. So yeah, it, but I think now more than ever, as the antis have raised, because there's hundred more brands than ever but like hundreds and hundreds more it's a lot more expensive to be seen uh, retailers are over you know d- um accepting on brands and launching new brands like no tomorrow and they're struggling from a pnl perspective it's good to be open and, and again collaborate because if we can help each other make some potentially fatal decisions we should av- avoid them for yeah, our brands definitely. and that's the true responsible future right for our businesses is helping each other yep. i think that's that's why i even do this podcast um but yeah so anyway, that's a bit about that I, I digress but it's, it's, i guess it's a good little uh, important yeah uh, topic or segment uh, yeah <laughs> um but yeah um so i, I do want to talk a little bit before we um, start wrapping up and going into fire round questions sort of like the future of mirror water for you and what you're excited on in the horizon also from a product perspective because I I see so many more opportunities, and I'm sure you do too, with where it can go. Well, where to begin? Um, I think I also just tell you a little bit about some of my other struggles uh, when setting up the brand, because we're a year and a half old now. And when I first launched, first of all, I had never worked in a team before. I've been working for myself for the past 14, 15 years. So to even start working in a team environment was a completely new experience for me. I had never used Slack before. I'd never used Notion before. I had never yeah. like done any of that. I was texting the girls on WhatsApp, and that's how we were planning out what we were doing. So I will just say there was a huge learning curve. Forget about the brand, but just about how to work on a day-to-day um, schedule, how to plan for the future, how to have editorial calendars, this, that, and the other thing. That was a huge chunk of time that was taken up just from simply figuring out how to run this machine. Um, and now I still have a very small team. It's um, three or four of us full-time, so we're teeny tiny still, which is bigger than when we started. Um but, you know, just learning and figuring that out was, was the first thing for me. So now I want to say that it's been a year and a half. And now that those teething problems are hopefully out of the way as much as they can be, um, you know, we've really spent this past year and a half laying the groundwork for our brand, helping people understand what we're all about and us ourselves even learning, you know, what's working, what's not working. So I'm excited to kind of, we're calling it mirror water 2.0 internally. I'm excited to kind of take it to the next phase now, which is, okay, we've told everybody about our brand. We're educating people on our products. We're, you know, in a couple great retailers. 
what can we do next? So I think for us, we're doubling down on body care. We love body care and we're hoping to launch, um, one or two new products next year, as you know, very, very expensive to launch products. Um, and just making sure that cash flow is there, you know, it's tough out here. So hopefully yeah. launching one or two new products in the body care realm. And also we're really keen to start working with other experts, other founders, like you said um, earlier about, you know, collaborating and teaching our community about wellness from other angles. So for instance, we are going to hopefully do some work with an acupuncturist and just teaching people more about acupuncture. So nothing necessarily to do with body care, but becoming more of a sort of wellness hub for people to learn about wellness because, you know, skincare, body care, that's just one side of it. And we recognize that. So hopefully teaming up with lots of exciting yeah. experts and then just building on our community. We want to do more events. We want to do one in-person event every single month. Um, whether that's yoga, whether that's just getting drinks with people, whether that's going for a walk in the park with our community, just, having those face-to-face -face moments I think is so important, especially when you're still a small brand. Um, so I think that's going to be our big yeah. focus for this year. That's amazing. Well, I bag Z and invite to the next in-person event. Okay. That's all my answer. You can come. <laughs> <laughs> but done. Um, so no, but I think also one thing I will leave, I'll, I'll leave it with, which I think to be inspiring on what body has the potential of. I was at a Sephora summit recently and the number one skincare brand right now is Sol de Janeiro, which is a body care yes. brand at first, right? And never in the history did Sephora or retailer think that a body care brand would be the largest category, one of the largest in Sephora in general, but also of skin. So I think it just shows this huge movement to leave what traditionally body has been stuck in this mastige, um, you know, um, shelves of, of you know, uh, even supermarkets or uh, yeah. stores and instead show the importance of people are willing to invest in brands that are not just amazing products, but about wellness and connecting with yourself. There's a story, there's an emotion. And that's for me, what body is uh, growing up in India. You know, we always used adjectives um, and words that were like a bit more about emotion. So we had this thing called sneha. And sneha means lovingly putting on oil. So it wasn't about just putting oh. on oil. It's about what is your emotion? So my grandma used to put on oil and say, I'm, you know, it's a time for sneha. Like I'm going to like oil, but with emotion. Oh. So I feel that's where it's really important. That I love what you're doing. It's, it feels like a connection. That is to so, that oh, I love that I story. Doing. That's so nice. And you can yeah, come work awesome. for us at Mirror Water any day because you totally get it. But any I think that's time. exactly it. I, I get it. You know, <laughs> Um, you know, I, I also want to say sometimes I feel like we do our amazing skincare routine and I'm guilty of it. I love my vitamin C, my retinol, slap it all on. And then, you know, you get to your body and sometimes you don't even look down. You just want to like ignore your body that it, you know, exists yeah. and you just kind of slap on your lotion really quickly and get out the door. But actually what about that 90% below your neck? And I love what you said about applying it lovingly. Take that extra 45 seconds to just, you know, look at your body, connect with your body, self-massage. It's so amazing. And I think there's a lot of ties between your self-esteem and using body care and just, you know, being able to look at yourself, feel yourself and accept yourself. So I absolutely love body care. And I think what Soul has managed to do at Sephora is beyond insane. Um, so, you know, we think there's going to be a huge body care boom. Hopefully people want to try mirror water. You never know. We could be Sephora buddies one day. <laughs> Pray for me. Exactly. Oh, no, no. I'm going to manifest that. It's going to happen. Uh, I, I, I strongly believe when I look at a brand from a first glance, I can tell the potential and mirror water has, I mean, infinite potential. Oh. So new to the industry, but I already have such a big impact. So I'm, I'm excited oh, for what's Thank come. you so truly, much. Truly. I needed to hear that today because you know how yeah, it yeah. ebbs and flows no. and the lows are low, the highs I know are high. You're, so you're really, I'll you. tell you, you're, you're, you're really onto something. You know, when it's good is when a founder is like, I would invest in that. Oh, I wish I created that. That's how I feel when I look at Mirror Water. So trust oh, me. Oh, thank you. Well, really invest good. in us, please. We're always looking. <laughs> Well, again, let, 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 let's talk. Uh, I do invest in beauty brands, so we can talk. Yeah, I'll call you. Okay, we'll um, speak. So now five round questions. But the first question is, a uh, pre, pre-question is kind of, I guess it was one of your things you said, and maybe I'm giving you your goal. I said, I'm going to invite you to a desert island now. But unfortunately, I'm being really mean. 
and uh, you can only bring one mirror water product. So what is your go-to mirror water product? Uh, it's going to be tough on a desert island, but it has to be smooth. Yeah. That's our body oil. It's our best seller. It really is a gorgeous product. Um, so it's a product for daily use. It's a satin finish. So it's not a dry oil, but it's not as greasy as a, a regular oil. So it dries really quickly. It has the most amazing essential oils, vetiver, cedarwood, Canadian black spruce, and bergamot. And though that blend is um, said to help you ground yourself and feel uplifted as well at the same time. So it's a truly gorgeous product. I love applying it straight out of the shower. Stunning. Oh, beautiful. Smooth body oil, everyone. I'm going to put the website link anyway below so people can just shop and listen at the same time. Right? Let's just be a bit more <laughs> omnichannel. I love that. Um, so my next um, fire run the beginning first question actually is what's another beauty brand that you're currently loving right now what's another beauty brand that i'm currently loving right now sorry i'm just repeating the question because i'm buying yeah. myself some time <laughs> oh <laughs> it's so hard because i love so many beauty brands i am obsessed with beauty i have to say i love refi i love refi yeah yeah. I think they're incredible. Well, I, is incredible. Yeah. It is truly remarkable. I am someone that gets sent a lot of beauty products, obviously, but Refi is the brand that I will purchase with my own money and get my eyebrows up and the blushes are amazing. I, I have to say, I absolutely love it. Love that. My next question is, what or where is your happy place? My happy place is in the forest. No surprises here because my brand smells like forests with my dog. So every weekend I take her to the woods wow. and we go for a walk together. And it's um, it's called a decompression walk. That's what the um, dog behavior has said because Ooh, it helps my dog decompress. And I was saying to the behaviorist, like, does she really need to do this all the time? And it's just like, I'm going to need to get a car and I'm going to need to go to the forest and everything. And the behavior said, maybe you also need a decompression walk. And it's done wonders for me. So in the forest with my dog, for sure. Oh, love, love, love. Um, my next question is, what is your hidden or maybe not so hidden talent? Well... I don't know if this is a talent, but this is something about me. I can speak to literally anyone. So you put someone in front of me, I can make conversation with them, whether that's my Uber driver, that is... whether that's someone in the cafe, and maybe that's me being Canadian, but I can pretty much I love... squeeze It might be you being Canadian, the most friendliest. <laughs> yeah. I love that. <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> um, and my last question is, if you weren't a beauty entrepreneur or in this beauty space, what would Estee be doing right in this moment? That's so hard because it's, it's hard to know what you yeah. would or might be doing. But I think sometimes, sometimes I think, what if this was all gone tomorrow? What would I really do? Um, I know it's boring, but I just, I love advertising. I love branding. I love, I think probably maybe working for an agency doing something like that. Um, other than that, I think I would probably be running a bed and breakfast, which is two totally different things, but Ooh. I would love to kind of find a property, flip it, decorate it exactly how I want, make it perfect for social media and have people come in and stay. I think I would really enjoy that. Oh, I love that. But the reason why I ask this question is because I'm always like, we should remind ourselves, like, what's next? Could be next, right? This life is full of new ventures and adventures or side yeah. adventures. But um, I always love hearing people's responses. It's always never what I expect. So I love that. What's yeah. yours? What would you be doing? Um, that's a really, I, I think, I, I know I would be doing, I would probably be, I would probably move to either India or Africa and focus all my energies on wildlife conservation. So like be a wildlife mm -hmm. photographer and act 
I'm like a yeah activist. I will be doing that. That's what I know for sure. Uh, wow. Maybe not the photographer part, but the plan I have long term is eventually when I sell the business, etc. Majority of the funds will go to my charity I'm building, which is about wildlife conservation, not my pocket. Oh wow! And then I want to manage that fund to build a lot more infrastructure in India, Africa. Uh, oh my god! My dad was born in Africa. My mom was born in India. So I just like those are my two connected spaces. But I've always grown up around loving animals first. So I thought. Let's focus on wildlife. So oh, yeah, that's, that's like my so long-term amazing. mission. And my why. I love that. I want to be there yeah. to support that. And I was actually reading an article oh my God. last night in, in National Geographic about elephants. I love elephants. Yeah. Uh, they're amazing. And you know, um, for example, a little story to finish is like, right, we've done a lot of um, donation work already. Um, and we recently built these um, solar panels uh, for um, water holes if for tigers to have access to clean water away from the villages because often when they come close to the village they get poached or not poached or even um, killed because of just the fact that they're close to the livelihood of the, the villages which is the cattle etc so you want them to stay into the actual like jungle and the forest so these are really important but what's happened is for the last hundred years these villages are kind of encroaching onto the tiger spaces they've been there for so long it's a battle of land and the tigers are suffering because ultimately the little prey run away, the deers, the tigers don't have much food. They have to go to the villages and kill the cattle. So we built these water holes. They got all destroyed because elephants were coming in from nowhere and started stepping on them. So we had to rebuild them at the top. So initially we we're like, oh no, these elephants, what have you done? But actually the crazy thing is, is these elephants are saving the tigers because the last... 20, 50, 10 years we've been trying to pay even more than the relocation amount to the villagers to move to another town because that's the only way to help the tigers survive is not encroaching they haven't accepted the payment they don't care they'll live with near the tigers they just don't want to move but now that elephants are there they're actually accepting the money to move because elephants are far more dangerous to them than tigers um oh. so elephants have now saved are saving tigers right now so it's wow. interesting how connected the whole area is yeah so that's a little story that's there. amazing um, i love that story happening. i'm gonna tell everyone yeah. that and, um, story now <laughs> yeah yeah so there's a little um fun fact of how connected we think the world is when we, we or you think something and then suddenly it saves you so i my first thought was oh my yeah. god these elephants get rid of them they're killing all the, they get them out of the area and now i'm like no no stay in the area so you don't know <laughs> yeah. until you until you you, you know true. <laughs> but anyway uh, there's a little story to end but um i won't leave you too, too long I, I know you have a brand to build but we'll, we'll continue our conversation <laughs> offline and can't definitely wait to continue this friendship but for everyone listening uh, where can they continue to follow yourself and the brand so they can follow me on instagram and youtube uh, my name is estee lalonde e-s-t-e-e-l-a-l-o-n-d-e and of course, you can go follow my brand at mirrorwater.earth. And our website is the same, www.mirrorwater.earth. I love that. Um, well, I'll put all the links in the summary. People can just tap straight away. And well, till, very, till, till we meet in person very soon, I'm excited to continue this conversation. I know. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glowing because it's just so nice to speak to someone who gets in and um, it's so great to connect. I'm so glad we got to do this podcast. <laughs>